Hi everyone, and welcome to this exciting webinar from science and guidelines to food systems transformation. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Afton Halloran, and I'm excited to be moderating this session today in the lead up to the United Nations Food Systems Summit. Over the next two hours, we're going to discuss one of the biggest societal challenges of our time, how to change our eating habits. This webinar uses the upcoming revision of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations as a point of departure for discussing many other themes, such as establishing sustainability criteria and implementing dietary guidelines that are backed by strong scientific evidence. Here in the Nordic region, we played, wit we played witness to a numerous singles, signals of change when it comes to how and what we eat. Did you know that, for example, meat sales are down in Finland for a second year in a row? Or that top chefs in the Nordic region are turning to the plant kingdom for inspiration? Denmark even has a vegan political party. But the issue is here that we actually are seeing these as weak signals of change in relation to the transformative actions that need to occur if we as a society want to address issues like overweight and obesity, or climate change and biodiversity loss. We still have a long way to go. What's interesting is that we're all gathered here today because we want to change the way we eat and thereby change food systems. Thanks so much for gathering us, uh, for joining us in this pursuit. We want to know a little more about you. So please use the code on the screen to sign into Menti. There you're going to find two questions that we would like you to answer. And we'll get back to those later in the program. So without further ado, let's kick things off by hearing from the Finnish Minister of Agriculture and Forestry, Jari Leppa, and he's going to set the scene for today's webinar. Dear friends, it is my great honor to open this site uh, even unsustainable of food systems in the Nordic regions. I'm very happy to see so many talking part. It is clear that uh, we have to reform our food systems to active sustainable development goals. Some of the greatest challenges facing the world today are ending hunger active food security, food safety, improved nutrition, and uh, promoting sustainable agriculture. Food system also play a key role in combating and uh, adapting to climate change. So, what can we do? How can we transform our food systems. We can talk together. Working, working together uh, creates trust and stability. In June, the Nordic ministers outlined the uh, priorities for strengthening the sustainable of our food systems locally, regionally, and uh, on the global level. Our joint declaration states that the uh, holistic approach to food systems is important. All three dimensions of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social are crucial. Everyone should have access to, sustainable, uh, to sufficient, safe and uh, nutritious food. The Nordic countries are willing to share experiences, innovations and uh, best practices. I would like to highlight the following topics. Nordic nutrition 
recommendation, school meal, food waste, one health and uh, genetic diversity. Diet uh, improvements must be based on science. The Nordic nutrition recommendations are international uh, recommendations. Next year's update will uh, integrate environmental sustainability into the guidelines too. Natural balances school meals have proven to have important health impact on children. They have an essential role in improving learning opportunities and results. Offering school meals also support uh, gender equality between students and uh, strengthens the local economy. The Nordic countries work intensively on the reduction of food lost and waste, usually up to a third of food is lost or wasted along the chain. A circular uh, economy is uh, part uh, of the solution. They building new business models. We also have an opportunity to reduce uh, emissions. The health of uh, human beings, animals, plants and uh, environmental are interlinked and uh, is best dealt with uh, using the One Health approach. Genetics diversity is the foundation of all food production. The Nordic countries have set uh, an example by investing in the uh, storage of agriculture genetics material in the Nordic Chinese bank. I believe that we, the Nordic countries, can inspire and uh, encourage other countries in the process of transforming food systems. Likewise, we can learn from others. I wish you all very fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much to Minister Gary Lepa for really summing up what this webinar is all about. And just a reminder to those of you who are logging in just now that we have a Menti survey and you can use the code that's displayed on the screen so you can see where to log in to answer the questions that we have for you. But now I want to move into the part of the program where we'll hear about what happens when dietary guidelines meet sustainability. And there's no better person to tell us about that than Professor Wuna Blomhoff. He's the project leader for, Nord for the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations Committee. Runa, I'm going to hand it over to you to explain what's happening with Nordic, the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations. Thank you, Afton. Um, so um, the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation, or NNR, have for, men, for more than 40 years been the common scientific evidence base for nutrition recommendation in Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. The NNR has also influenced and shaped national recommendation in several other countries. The NNR is an example of the Nordic model where regional cooperation is used to produce the best available scientific evidence, science advice for the national food and health authorities. The Nordic food and health authorities have a good tradition in accepting the science advice. NNR is therefore the foundation for national implementation in each of the countries. Due to this transparent implementation of science advice, the population in Nordic countries have a relatively huge trust and confidence in food and health authorities. Next slide, please. 
The NNR 2022 project is a four year project that will end with the publication of the sixth edition of NNR in December 2022. The project is funded by the Nordic Council of Ministers, as well as the food and health authorities in the Nordic countries. In the NNR 2022 project, we have also invited the three Baltic countries, since they also use NNR as the basis for their national food policies. A fundamental new aspect of this edition of NNR is that the Nordic Council of Ministers have requested that sustainability should be fully integrated as a basis for the recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, we have, um, next slide, please. We have developed quite an extensive and complex organization of the NNR 2022 project. Partly because it is a huge task that needs collaboration between a number of different types of scientists, and par partly also because we strongly aim at synthesizing total evidence as unbiased and objectively as possible. We have a number of checkpoints with principles of checks and balances to prevent the bias of individual scientists. The Central NNR 2022 Committee organized the whole project and has a major responsibility for the recommendations. We have an excellent international scientific advisory group with some world leading experts. We have a novel Nordic system at systematic review center and a number of scientists specialized on specific topics. In total, more than 400 scientists participate in the project. We have also a number of peer review processes, as well as open hearings integrated in the project. Next slide, please. The final aim or the final product of the project is to formulate recommendations for these 36 nutrients and these 15 food groups. Our initial task is to assess the health effect of these nutrients and foods. This is in itself a huge unique and extensive task that will, that we will scrutinize several thousand of scientific papers. After we have considered these health effects, we will integrate sustainability into the recommendations. We have published several methodological papers and we have arranged open webinars and workshops in order to be open and transparent on the process and the principles for setting the recommendations. Next slide, please. To support us when integrating sustainability, we have made a contract with Chatham House in London, which is an independent institute that has served as consultants for a number of governments, including UK, EU, G20 countries. Our main collaborators from Chatham House are Tim Benton and Helen Harmon. Tim is very experienced in um, in this type of work. He has been a consultant for the World Economic Forum, a lead author of several IPCC and other reports, and as well as many scientific papers related to sustainability. Helen Harvard is also an experienced scientist in the field. She is partly on the leadership team for Action Track 2 of the UN Food System Summit, among other relevant tasks. In addition to Chatham House, we have also recruited more than 50 sustainable, sustainability experts from the Nordic and Baltic countries, including Amanda Wood from Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. She's also a well-known scientist in the field with a lot of expertise on local food systems and sustainability. Both Helen and Amanda will present later in this session. Next slide, please. May I have the next slide, please? The food system is generally considered as a link between dietary guidelines and sustainability. The term food system include all processes and infrastructure involved in the feeding, in feeding a nation. Production, including crop growing and harvesting, livestock production, all aspects of producing of food, packing, distribution, transport, consumption and marketing, 
and waste and disposal of food and food related items. Our task is therefore to try to understand how healthy diet guidelines can interact with the food system in such a way that we reach the ambitious sustainability goal set by the Nordic Council of Ministers and the Nordic countries. Next slide, please. This is an illustration showing how the healthy diet guidelines uh, is linked to sustainability through the food system. Sustainability is a multidimensional concept that includes both environmental, social, and economical dimension, as well as other several other aspects. We will have a major focus on the environmental aspects, but we will also consider other aspects of sustainability. Climate is, of course, a major issue considered together with biodiversity and decline of nature and ecosystems. But there is also a range of other environmental issues that is needed to be considered some overlapping and intertwined with the other environmental components. We will use we will synthesize available evidence from life cycle analysis of relevant food and, and food groups. Life cycle analysis is the analysis of the product entire life cycle in terms of sustainability. Additionally, we will also broaden the scope of analysis from product level assessment to system analysis. This system-based analysis will be important to cover various feedback responses in the food system. So to sum up, next slide, please. So to sum up, based on the local food system in each of the eight countries, a synthesis of the best available scientific evidence, both in the area of health and sustainability, we will develop science advice for the health and food authorities in eight Nordic and Baltic countries in order to improve the health of their citizens as well as the health of the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Runa, for your presentation. And as we've heard, the upcoming 2022 Nordic Nutrition Recommendations, the revision that you've heard about, will set a new tone for merging nutrition and environmental sustainability. But how do we actually establish sustainability criteria? So Dr. Helen Harwat, uh, who you've heard about in Ruta's presentation, uh, she's a senior re uh, researcher from Chatham House in the UK. She's going to fill us in on how to do that. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Helen, and you have eight minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much and hello everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, can I see my slides, please? Yeah, okay. I'm going to cover foods, diet, and sustainability as well as I can in eight minutes. So next slide, please. Thank you. So, of course, food systems depend on land and impact the environment in many ways. And actually, food systems are the major or a major um, contributor to really many of the major issues that we need to deal with today. And of course, uh, if we look over to this chart here, we can see that agriculture is actually occupying around half of all of our habitable land. And the majority of that is actually occupied by animal agriculture. So really significant impacts as well on that. And of course, being the major driver of biodiversity loss overall. Next slide, please. Thank you. And in addition to actually, sorry, I'm just having a slight technical issue. In addition to being a very complex system itself, the food system is actually part of a much more complex system. So if we look at land use, for example, there are many different competing uses of our land. So when we think about sustainability, it's really not even just limited to the realms of the food system, but it's really about maintaining ecosystems in their entirety and the services that we depend on within those ecosystems and the boundaries that they need to operate within at a global and local scale. So sustainability for the whole system really requires on recognizing the upper limits of production across all of those systems combined. Next slide, please. And in addition to actually 
the, the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions rapidly. So just taking an example of climate change within those major problems that we need to tackle, we actually also need to remove large amounts of CO2 from the atmosphere. And this really brings food systems and the land that they occupy right back into the picture quite substantially. So here we have an example that we published last year where we basically mapped the, the carbon suppressed by current um, animal agriculture as one example as a major land user. So this is essentially the land that is the carbon, the CO2, sorry, that is prevented from being taken from the atmosphere due to the suppression of the native vegetation under the current um, land use. So clearly food systems will become increasingly important in tackling our major issues going forward in terms of the need to transform them. Next slide, please. So there are a few different approaches to thinking about sustainable diets. So first of all, we have life cycle analysis, which essentially estimates the environmental impact per unit of product over the entire life cycle. Next slide, please. And this is usually from the kind of farm gear or the farm impact through to the point of purchase in the retail environment. And here you can see a number of different examples of high protein foods. And just to highlight this example here, which is comparing beef with tofu for the same amount of protein, beef actually emits around 25 times more greenhouse gases and takes around 75 times more land to produce that protein and also has a, a bigger acid acidification, eutrophication, and water scarcity impact as well. Next slide, please. And some one analysis here as an example has combined some health impacts with environmental impacts of different foods. So you can see those highlighted in green there are actually the foods that have the lowest relative risk of mortality and also the lowest environmental impact. Next slide, please. So there are some um, limitations of life cycle assessment. While it's generally incredibly useful, it doesn't always account for the kind of system limit. So one example is the New Zealand dairy industry, where they drove efficiency per unit of product, but actually that reduced costs of production, which in turn increased production. So the, the absolute impact of the industry was actually increased overall. It could also lead to substitution hierarchies that might actually shift problems or make problems worse. So for example, shifting from beef to chicken increases the number of um, farmed animals in the system, which could in increase the requirements for antibiotics and also feed. And it also misses hard to measure impacts or hard to quantify impacts like biodiversity loss, for example. Next slide, please. So system approaches look at the whole system and ask what's actually possible within those planetary boundaries or geobiophysical thresholds and actually seeks to apportion them in some way across society. Next slide, please. So one example from the literature where that was um, conducted, uh, I just want to draw attention to that final row there in green along the bottom. So essentially this was the only combination of dietary shift to flexitarian and technological innovation with agricultural production and a reduction in food waste that actually was within those constraints of the five planetary boundaries used in this analysis. Next slide, please. And while planetary boundaries is an incredibly useful concept and that analysis itself was incredibly useful, there are some limitations with using the planetary boundaries in the current form in that they're not necessarily robustly estimated in terms of the one and a half degrees limit, for example, and all of land use by agriculture. And they're not necessarily easily downscalable to local boundaries. They can miss some hard to measure impacts like biodiversity. And also there are governance issues in terms of like who actually decides to translate those global limits down to local consumption. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, just to wrap up, uh, next slide, please. 
there is no simple solution, unfortunately. We don't just have a simple answer to this. Um, there are really useful measures or techniques out there, such as LCA and the systems approach or plan for boundaries. They can have some issues and trade-offs, um, but really it's absolutely clear that we need to describe what better diets actually look like to reduce their environmental impact. Next slide, please. So environmental pressures alone are really necessitating food system transformation. Business as usual isn't an option for any sector of the economy going forward. And actually in the food system, this would increase land conversions and increase greenhouse gas emissions under a business as usual scenario. Um, in contrast, if we actually start to shift diets, this could actually free up plenty of land to help achieve those carbon dioxide reduction goals that we talked about earlier. So for example, here shifting to fully plant-based diet would remove the equivalent of 16 years of CO2 emissions from the atmosphere, which is around two thirds of the amount that we need to align with one and a half degrees. Next slide, please. So dietary change um, uh, is really key for health, biodiversity and climate, uh, along with a whole co um, range of co-benefits and relative to today's diet, a healthy diet is also a more sustainable one, one that is diverse, rich in plants and whole grains, lower in meat and processed products as well. And final slide, please. So rather than us identifying a kind of one size fits all dietary pattern, what we're actually looking at is some candidate rules of thumb for how to actually think about dietary shifts and consumption within the context of dietary guidelines. So we're using a best available foods um, approach, and that is essentially looking at limiting consumption to sufficient, increasing whole foods and decreasing processed foods, aiming for a diverse range of fruits and vegetables and predominantly plant-based diets. And of course, production techniques actually do matter. So where possible, source from agroecological farming techniques. And that is all from me. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Helen. And you managed to keep within the time limit. It's, you're saying a lot in a short period of time, but as we've heard, uh, we need to establish criteria for measuring the sustainability and environmental sustainability of our diets, just as we need to measure nutrient intake, for example. Uh, this is going to be an, a really important step in transforming food systems. But how do we move beyond the establishment of criteria and move towards real on the ground change? How do we get a population to eat according to the new dietary recommendations and guidelines? So Dr. Amanda Wood is going to walk us through some of the approaches, just some, uh, that we can take to implement these recommendations and guidelines. I'm gonna hand the floor over to you, Amanda, for your presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Afton. And if I could just have my slides up and just to say thanks to the Nordic Council of Ministers for inviting me to talk about how we can get the most impact out of the Nordic nutrition recommendations in NR. Uh, now that they will incorporate both sustainability and health. So our task over the coming years is going to be bringing to life the NNR and the dietary guidelines that they underpin and seeing those wonderful recommendations reflected in all of these places where we eat and make decisions about food. So at home, at the grocery store, and when we eat out either for a quick bite or a more leisurely meal. Next slide, please. And there's some good news that's going to make this task a bit easier in the Nordics because there have been some wonderful tools and initiatives created in the region to bring the NNR to life. So you'll hear from speakers later to discuss things like school meal programs, labeling systems, and national food-based dietary guidelines. So these initiatives are the tools already in the toolbox of the governments in the Nordics, and they've no doubt made it easier for individuals to eat more sustainably and healthier in the region. So if you want an overview of all of the public sector initiatives that have been developed in the Nordics, you can check out the solutions men menu, a report produced by the Nordic Council of Ministers linked on the screen, but I'm not sure if actually you can see that. Um, so maybe we can put that up. Next slide, please. 
But our challenge is that these initiatives have not been enough alone to see the scale of change that we need. So for example, we know that many people across the Nordics aren't following the national dietary guidelines we already have, but are instead eating uh, lots of foods high in saturated fat, added sugar or salt, eating more red and processed meat than recommended and lacking in fruits, vegetables, pulses, nuts, and seafood or all of the healthy things. So these unhealthy diets place a big burden on our health and represent one of the leading risk factors for poor health and mortality across the Nordics. Next slide, please. We also know that these diets are coming at a cost to environmental health. Um, so for example, the Swedish diets uh, exceed the sustainable per capita threshold for several indicators of environmental sustainability, including greenhouse gas emissions, cropland use, nutrient application and extinction rate, as you can see on this figure to the right. So here that smaller red ring indicates a sustainable threshold of impact. So all of those red radials outside of the ring indicate an increasing risk for the environment. So while there are differences in eating patterns across the Nordics, we expect this overall picture of environmental impact from diets that we see in the Swedish diet to be broadly similar across the Nordics. Next slide, please. So if we want to strengthen and complement the initiatives already in place to go that next step, what can we do? So I wanna talk about three different approaches that have already taken root in the Nordics, some with longer histories than others, uh, that can continue to guide action in the region as well as be used in, in other countries. And the first is to think outside of this grocery bag, box or basket, if we wanna increase the reach of the new recommendations. So in other words, we need to be looking beyond the immediate environment of the individual and take a systems approach. So next slide, please. So yes, we can and should be targeting this more immediate environment uh, by, for example, changing the way we advertise food or changing the way we educate about food. So these types of initiatives are important foundations of knowledge. Next slide, please. But we also need to zoom out and see that there are all of these other factors beyond the media environment that influence what a person eats. So for example, what type of food is produced? How does it get transformed as it moves along the value chain? And then where does it end up? So one study really drove home this point when they looked at food-based dietary guidelines around the world, not just in the Nordics, and then looked at food supply. And they found that in general, with lots of regional variation, the food supplies were not aligned with the national and international food-based dietary guidelines. So we can't expect people to adopt sustainable diets when what they see in the store, the restaurant, um, contradicts what they're seeing in the guidelines. Again, this highlights the importance of the systems approach by identifying, supporting, and scaling solutions all across the food system, because ultimately those solutions are going to make it easier for the individual to make the more sustainable choice. So let me underscore that this isn't an either or situation. We don't need either initiatives aimed at the individual or at the broader food system but we need a package of initiatives that all complement and reinforce each other. Next slide, please. So the second approach goes hand in hand with the first, uh, and this is to take an all hands on deck approach, meaning focus on inclusive engagement. So because we're dealing with food systems, that means everyone is shaping the system in one way or the other. So governments have a key role in creating sustainable food policy, public policy, as I um, mentioned with some of the previous initiatives. But there are a lot of others who can support and amplify the impact of those initiatives. So this slide just shows a few examples of who we can and should be engaging. So the key to this hands, all hands on deck or inclusive engagement approach is seeing how each of these groups can draw on their unique strengths and influence to make a positive change in the food system. Next slide, please. The third approach then really brings together uh, systems thinking and inclusive engagement. And this is taking a mission-based approach. 
So think of that moonshot mission, but now societal missions instead of the more technical moonshot missions um, have been made popular at the EU level and are being trialed in the Nordics. So what is this approach? Uh, it's to tackle grand challenges like climate change, hunger or inequality we need to define missions, and these have a clear, measurable, time-bound, but very ambitious target. So these missions aren't achieved through one big project, but rather through a diverse and linked portfolio of experiments here shown as mission projects. So some experiments will fail and others will succeed, but the idea is that they're all aiming towards the same mission goal and that these experiments are engaging a wide range of actors from all parts of the food system. Next slide, please. Just quickly for a more tangible example framed in the Nordic context, to address some of these big challenges, we can find, we can use the entry points of say, changing our diets and meals. The, spe the specific mission could then be to ensure that by 2025, time bound, all public meals consumed in the Nordics are sustainable and tasty. Um, then a range of smaller experiments here called demonstrators could work to see how policymakers, producers, distributors, food service outlets, and so forth can make changes that help reach that goal. Next slide, please. So to sum up, to succeed in our task of bringing the NNR and the National Dietary Guidelines to life, uh, we need to look at connections. So connections all across the food system, connecting change makers with the guidelines and connecting all of our initiatives back to the individual in an effort to make the most sustainable option the easiest option in their everyday environment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, and now I want to turn to you, the participants in this webinar, to uh, hear the questions that you've been asking and to pose these questions to uh, the three speakers that you've just heard from. So first of all, uh, I've been gathering in these different uh, questions and unfortunately we won't have time for all of them, but I'm gonna start off and give an opportunity to each of the three speakers. I'm gonna pose one question to each of them. And if we have time, we'll go for another round. Um, so first of all, the question is to Rune, um, why are meat substitutes and plant-based drinks, for instance, not included in the analysis? I think uh, at this point, we, we focus on foods and diet and not supplements. So everything that could be um, considered as, uh, as a regular diet and not as supplements will be included in these, uh, these food-based dietary guidelines. Thank you very much, Rona. Um, so the next question is to Helen. Um, so how does NNR account for the shortcomings of life cycle assessment? Um, some were mentioned, but from a Nordic perspective, grazing nutrients actually, uh, grazing, sorry, grazing uh, ruminants uh, actually are necessary to maintain the biodiversity of landscapes and for several ecosystem services. How would you respond to that? Thank you. Yeah, great question. And it's definitely something that we're still unpacking. So I don't have a full answer to that right now. You'll have to wait a little bit longer until we've actually gone through those processes and devised the analyses. But essentially what we're looking at is the, the rules of thumb that I mentioned in my presentation, and then really trying to put them within the context of the Nordic region. And with those issues mentioned, there are exactly the sort of issues that we will be looking at. And that's really the sort of the uniqueness of this approach that we're taking the kind of existing evidence and then really trying to unpack what that means for the Nordic region. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Amanda, uh, this is a question for you. Can you comment on the relationship between the keyhole label and the EcoScore labeling that's coming out of France right now and also spreading to other parts of Europe? Um, and can you comment on that as a potential labeling initiative within Farm to Fork? Yes, yeah, so I'm actually not an expert in uh, the labeling initiatives and can't comment too much about those because I don't know about them in detail, but I know that there's probably others on this 
call that are much more uh, knowledgeable about those programs. Um, Helen or Runa, would you feel comfortable answering that question? It was directed to Amanda, but, uh, but uh, you can pick up on it. Uh, I think you're on mute there, Runa. Uh, not really. I, I think there are so many issues related to the labeling business, and there are so many, many, many conflicting issues uh, from the different uh, health authorities and nations. So, so I think it uh, at this point, I think it's uh, it's hard to uh, to 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 respond to that. Uh, it's it's of course something that is deeply looked into. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Rona, back to you. Um, have you considered ultra processed foods in your recommendations? And then the, the follow up question uh, to that would be uh, now I'm combining two questions together, but they're related. The follow up question is how would you actually define ultra processed foods if you are uh, looking at that? So that's a good question. How do we define ultra processed foods? And uh, that is exactly what we are looking into now. We are working on, on the chapter on ultra processed foods. And, um, and um, we are not certain how fruitful the concept of ultra processed foods uh, will be for us, but uh, we will look into it and we will try to see whether we can uh, develop a definition. Uh, we can follow a definition and see how useful it will be for the, for the food-based dietary guidelines. So, so it's too early to say. Um, we are in the midst of that process exactly right now. Thanks very much. And Helen, over to you now for the, the next question. Uh, are you accounting for technological evolution in the food system or in food systems um, that, are, that is limiting uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, as we see today? So I guess kind of looking forward for change or within the in, within the coming years? Is that being accounted for? Yeah, it certainly is in the analysis that I've been involved in previously that I presented in my presentation and also in the planetary boundaries work that I presented as well. They accounted for technological improvements to um, chemical application, for example, which would in turn reduce the use of those chemicals and in turn reduce the associated greenhouse gas emissions. So in many of the life cycle, sorry, not the life cycle, but the, the assessments that go forward up to 2050, for example, do take into account those technological improvements that in turn deliver greenhouse gas reductions. In terms of the, the Nordic this specific analysis that we're conducting for the NNR, um, I'm not entirely sure how far forward we will look and whether we will actually be conducting those kind of detailed analyses ourselves. I think the plan really is to use the existing evidence and synthesize that. So in that process, some of that will already be there because it's already in some of the existing evidence itself. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is for Amanda. So in terms of stakeholder groups uh, that you think should be more involved uh, in the processes uh, of basically transforming diets and food systems, are there any specific stakeholder groups that you've identified throughout your research that are, are kind of being uh, under, uh, that are being evolved uh, to a very limited extent or that could be involved more in the transition? Yeah, thanks, Efton. Absolutely, there there are so many groups. I think uh, if we if we if you look back on my slides, um, for for example, some of the the big businesses are are often engaged quite a bit, but some of the smaller groups or startups, uh, the tech community is just flourishing. Uh, but also thinking about things like artists, storytellers, uh, educators. I know there's a lot of movement here with medical education, uh, so healthcare professionals. Really, as I said, everyone shapes the food system in some way. And so everyone has their own unique power to, to make that a more sustainable food system. Um, so the, the challenge really is trying to, to bring all of those different groups together. Yep. 
Thank you very much. Um, and so, Wuna, over to you. Um, Amanda, uh, she mentioned in her presentation that saturated fats are, uh, mentioned saturated fats as a factor of a poor diet. Um, is a nuanced approach to saturated fats in the NNR um, being discussed in this edition, since all saturated fats are not equal uh, with respect to health out outcomes? Um, I understand that people are asking those type of questions, but I think I would like to comment on this exact at this point the moment, because we are considering all these health issues questions right now, uh, all up until up until uh, December 2022. 20, uh, so uh, of course we are looking carefully into all sorts of evidence, both molecular basic types of evidence, clinical evidence, epidemiology, and try to do our best in, uh, in the full scope of, uh, of, of lines of evidence uh, regarding uh, different uh, qualities of fat. But I would not like at this point, it's too early, but we are in the midst of the process of, of, uh, of considering the health effect of a variety of fats and, uh, and fat containing foods. Thanks, Bona. Um, so Helen, uh, another question for you. Uh, do you think that we can be more ambitious on the chain uh, in terms of change instead of making it soft change. Uh, why not uh, going towards going moving in a stronger direction towards plant based or plant rich diets instead of still promoting carbon heavy foods of animal origin. Um, the urgency of cl the climate emergency challenges our positions. How would you respond to that. Yeah, great question. And I, I think, you know, as I presented that really these major challenges that we're facing around climate change and biodiversity loss for example necessitate food system transformation we we can't look at business as usual and within that there's no kind of uh justification for trying to maintain current dietary patterns and certainly no ability to do that within the sort of option spaces to actually um meet the the climate goals and the the biodiversity goals and that example that i gave there about the additional requirements to remove co2 from the atmosphere really kind of just amplify this even more in terms of how important food system transformation is and we really do need to focus on that transformation aspect so we're really not talking about tweaks around the edges we are really talking about whole system shifts in, in, in a very transformative way across all sectors, not just the food system. Thank you. Uh, and final question in this round. So this is to Amanda. Uh, you're talking about environmental sustainability, um, but what about the other dimensions of sustainability, economic and social sustainability? Yeah, thanks. Great question. So these are huge and there are these multiple dimensions of sustainability. And when I do go out and talk with stakeholders, it's often not the health and environmental concerns that come up first. It's often how this is going to impact their livelihood or their life or their wallet and so forth. So I think if we are talking about action and impact, then we clearly do have to tackle all of these forms of sustainability. At the same time, we have to realize that um, this, this is a massive, massive task. And so this, it does also warrant taking it one bite of the elephant as, at a time and tackling now that we have health and now we're including envir environmental sustainability and we do need to expand that on. Um, but practically I can see why it's limiting that we can't just do all of those at the same time, but absolutely those are uh, incredibly important dimensions of sustainability to address. Thanks Amanda. Uh, so now I'd like to have a look at the Menti results. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to take you one at a time. I'll come back to the second question later on, but we wanted to know where you're coming from and which region, which country you are representing. Um, so if I could just have those results coming up, uh, then we can have a look together and see uh, where everyone is from. So we have a uh, good representation from the Nordic region, but also outside. I can see the UK, Switzerland, Estonia, for example, uh, South Africa. Um, 
it's very small on my screen, unfortunately, but you can all see it on yours. So very interesting um, that we are an international group here. Um, and thanks again for responding to the, the mentee. Now, I want to build on what we've learned from our previous speakers. As you've heard, the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations serve as the basis of national dietary guidelines. This, in, in essence, is the Nordic model, a joint scientific evidence base with various ways of implementation. So what's happening, for example, in Denmark, in Sweden, and in Finland? How are the recommendations being implemented in practice? I'd like to welcome our first speaker in this section of the program, Dr. Annika Sostrom, who is the Director General of the National Food Aid Agency of Sweden. And I'm going to hand over to her to explain what's happening, some of the things that are happening in Sweden. Annika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ethan. Can I have my first slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will tell you about the keyhole label today as an example of implementing science into a practical tool uh, to guide consumers for healthy diets, but also for food companies in their product development. Next slide, please. So the keyhole is a voluntary front of pack nutrition label, which indicates a healthier choice within a certain food category. It could be, for example, breakfast cereals, bread, dairy products, ready meals. And in Sweden, we have used this symbol for more than 30 years now. And in 2009, Denmark and Norway decided to introduce the, the keyhole on food products. Next slide, please. And next slide. So who is behind the keyhole? Next slide, please. Uh, the keyhole is really an example of a successful Nordic collaboration between the national food agencies in, in the Nordic countries. Maintaining consumer interest and appreciation in the label, as well as staying up to date with the scientific progress, is very time consuming. And in the Nordic working group, all countries are small. But by sharing the work between us four Nordic countries, the, the keyhole actually remains one of the most known front of pack labels globally. So we all benefit from, from sharing the workload as well as the positive experiences, of course, by, by working together. And in practice, we have two working groups, one focusing on communication and the other is a more scientific group ensuring that the criteria for the keyhole are updated according to progress in, in science. And therefore, we are careful now following the revision of the Nordic nutrition recommendations. And the keyhole is also found in Lithuania and Macedonia, but those countries are not involved in, in the working group that we have. So next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, the new Nordic nutrition recommendations are the scientific basis for the keyhole. And having this common scientific basis is the prerequisite for the successful development of, of the label. We couldn't have the keyhole without the new Nordic nutrition recommendations, I would say. Uh, the Swedish food-based dietary guidelines indicate the most important changes for a healthier uh, diet and are used as guidelines for setting the conditions for for the keyholes, and, and you can see our, our quick food-based dietary guidelines here as, as green, yellow, and, and red. And the keyhole have different criteria and thresholds for less than healthier fat, less sugar, less salt, more dietary fiber, more whole grain, more fruits and berries and vegetables and pulses. And besides those conditions, there are also some general conditions, like for example, no sweeteners are allowed, and also a uh, threshold for trans fatty acids, uh, which is even tougher than the EU uh, regulation. Next slide, please. Uh, the keyhole is not only in line with the food-based dietary guidelines in the Nordic countries. We sometimes call it a summary of the food-based dietary guidelines. By using the, the keyhole when you buy food, you actually get, get all the food-based dietary guidelines in, in, in one symbol, which makes it very easy for the consumers. Next slide, please. 
uh, building consumer knowledge and trust takes time and resources. And we have worked together on this now for more than 10 years. And today there is a high consumer knowledge about the keyhole. More than 95% of the Swedish population know the keyhole. And actually more than 60% claim they use the label to make healthy choices in, in food shops. Uh, the keyhole is also well integrated in primary health care where more than 50% of medical doctors, nurses, and dietitians claim they use the keyhole as a tool for inspiring to more healthy diets in communication with patients. And having the label as part of the education is one of many important contributions to increased health literacy and improve equality in health. And therefore, we are very happy to see that nearly three out of four teachers claim they use the label in their work in, in schools in, in the Nordic countries. Next slide, please. Finally, I would like to mention some key messages that we have learned from the Nordic collaboration on, on the keyhole. As I said before, a common scientific basis is a prerequisite for the efficient collaboration that we have and also for setting common goals. Also that we have interdisciplinary working group is a prerequisite for efficient collaboration and for reaching the goals. And also that we have created a very good working culture with focus on finding common solutions and the most and how and focus on the effect of our work rather than having national agendas. It's, um, it's a very good thing. And finally, rotating responsibility and sharing being share, being chair of the work increases participation and shares the, the workload. I think next slide is the last one. Yes, thank you very much. Over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Annika. Um, really important insights. And now we're going to change country. We're going to uh, move a bit further south uh, to Denmark. Uh, Denmark is a country that has been very busy lately updating their national dietary guidelines. And to tell us more about this, we're joined by Anna Enivolsen, and she's the head of unit at the National Food Agency of Denmark. I'm going to hand the floor over to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Afton, and thank you for the invitation to all of you. Can I have the next slide, please? In Denmark, we've uh, taken the first steps towards uh, a more healthy and sustainable diet. We launched our new food-based dietary guidelines in January. And we sort of started out with one of the corners in sustainability. So it's important for me to say that we haven't embraced all aspects of sustainability, but we sort of started out uh, with one of the corners, the climate. Today, I'll share some of our work and the challenges we've had on the way, which I hope can be of some values to others who might be in the similar or in the considerations of starting a process like ours. Next slide, please. Our work was uh, based on a scientific evidence report guidance for sustainable uh, healthy diets from the National Food Institute uh, from February 2020. Uh, the, the report included the Eat Lancet diet and sort of customized it, customized it for the Danish food culture. In addition, uh, the um, evidence report behind the previous dietary guidelines was also included as background material, as well as the Nordic nutrition recommendations. And of course, we are looking very much forward to having the new Nordic recommendations in 2022 to see if that affects our guidelines in, in several ways. Next slide, please. The development process has involved a lot of uh, stakeholders, including uh, different uh, ministries, uh, Danish health authorities, for example, it's included the National Food Institute, consumer organizations, non-governmental organization, as well as the food and retail industry, and of course, organizations within climate and sustain sustainability. We have also done some uh, pre-tests among consumers to uh, ensure that they can understand what we are trying to communicate to them. So that has also been uh, an important part of our process. Next slide, please. 
And here you see the guidelines. We have seven of them, and I'll just read them out loudly. The first one is uh, eat plant rich, varied, and not too much. Number two, eat more vegetables and fruit. Number three, eat less meat, choose legumes and fish. Number four, eat whole grain and food. Number five, choose vegetable oils and low fat dairy products. Number six, eat less sweet, salty, and fatty foods. And number seven, if thirsty, drink water. Next slide, please. It is important for us to stress that a lot of the guidelines are actually almost the same as earlier. Vegetables, water, whole grain foods, fish, and fruits are still very important choices when it comes to, to both climate and health. But of course, the climate focus has forced us to rethink our guidelines. And let me highlight some of the changes. We went from 10 to seven guidelines in order to make it less complicated for the consumers. We really uh, focused uh, and went from talking about nutrients, for example, fatty acids and sugar, uh, to talk about foods instead, because we believe that that'll make it easier for the consumer to actually use our guidelines. We have, as new things mentioned, plant rich. We advise to eat less meat and we advise to choose legumes instead. And if we go into some of the details, we've, for example, made a drastic cut down on all kinds of meat from to uh, 350 grams a week. And we advise to eat 100 grams of legumes a day. And that's a great shift since the consumers eat, for example, in, in average, five grams of legumes a day. So we really have a, a huge challenge here. Next slide, please. This might sound uh, easy to you since we've had the evidence and we've tested along the way, but it has uh, not at all been, been a walk in the park. We have faced a lot of challenges uh, on our way and I'll just share some of them with you. Um, we have of course uh, had some, I wouldn't say troubles, but it's, it has been challenges us to, to incorporate climate. Uh, it has been very new uh, in our guidelines, and we've had to do that without compromising the health aspects. That's, uh, of course, uh, we've had a lot of discussion on how to ensure the intake of, for example, protein when we were lowering meat intake, how to ensure the intake of calcium when lowering uh, the intake of dairy products, and so on. We've also faced a challenge when we had to tackle the gap between our food culture at the time and uh, what we recommend for a healthy and climate friendly diet. This is in particularly relevant when it comes to ad or our advice on eating less meat, as I said earlier. And another challenge is that we still need better data of the climate footprint from our foods in order to gather all our stakeholders on this important issue. We, uh, we, um, we see food companies are challenged regarding their possibilities of making claims. And we see municipalities who wants to claim the reduced carbon, carbon dioxide, et cetera. So, so that's a challenge at the moment. And um, in this process, it has been very crucial for us to involve uh, stakeholders. Uh, and of course, it's also a challenge to balance this involvement of stakeholders. We think it's crucial to ensure the implementation afterwards of the di dietary guidelines, for example, in order to achieve structural and behavioral changes. So we've had a lot of valuable discussions on how to formulate and communicate these new guidelines with our stakeholders. But it's also important for us to stress that we have not been discussing the scientific evidence. It is what it is, so to speak. So, and, and our experience is that uh, our stakeholders understand that and, and they contribute still, though they might not agree on, on all of it, but it has been very, very valuable for us. And last but not least, we are of course facing this huge challenge on how to implement our food-based dietary guidelines to all consumers and not only the well-educated. Uh, and I think we have had a lot of work to do there. Next slide, please. Yes, that's it for now for me. I think you moved on to the next speaker, but thank you for now. Thank you very much, Anna. And as you've said, there's a lot of challenges that lie in the way, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're starting somewhere and 
uh, thank you very much for also kind of sh sh being open and honest about these different challenges that, that uh, have been uh, con that you're confronting right now. So uh, now on to our final speaker in this portion of the program. We have Mariana Maninen, and she's a counselor of education at the National Agency for Education in Finland. And she's joining us today to speak about Finland's approach to school meals and how this connects to changing eating habits. Uh, Mariana, over to you. Thank you, Afton. And hello, everybody. It's great to be here today. So uh, the concept of well-being and sustainability has a broad meaning in Finnish education. The school play, plays an important role in promoting the food system by pupils' well-being, health and learning. Our aim is to ensure the well-being of the entire school community by food-related education. Next slide, please. So uh, the well-being has a positive impact on learning outcomes. The school culture takes care of the safety and well-being of each and every member of the learning community. The curriculum describes the objectives for education in health, nutrition, sustainability, and manners. Next slide, please. For seven years ago, it was necessary to change the curriculum in Finland. We have done some smaller changes also after the large updating in basic education. The purpose was to develop schools to meet the requirements of the society today and of the future. The drive for change arose especially from the need for increase the motivation of learning improve school satisfaction and well-being, of course. One key goal was to enhance pupil participation, increase the meaningfulness of learning, and make possible for every pupil to experience success. Particular aim was to develop the learning environments and work methods used in schools. A learning environment must be safe and inspire learning. So environments outside as well as inside school should be used more. So we think that school canteen works as a learning environment as well as the classroom. Next slide, please. Finland is using schools to improve the health of their pupils. National policies require that schools provide obligatory health education classes, physical education, and nutrition and cooking lessons in home economic classes. Also, healthy and free school meals play an important role in promoting health and well being, as well as sustainability. Finland has also issued recommendations that schools reduce pupils' access to sugary, high-fat snacks and drinks, as well as on how foods should be marketed to children. Municipalities are required to ensure that each school provides free annual health examinations for all pupils and give personalized advice on mental health, healthy eating, and physical fitness. And through these services, school nurses are able to monitor the health of the child and the well being of the entire family. As a result of those efforts, the increase in childhood obesity has started to stabilize across the country. And next slide, please. Two of the most important factors contributing to eating habits and well being at school are cooking lessons at home economics and school meals with food related education. So, the food functions as a pedagogical tool for teaching sustainability, good nutrition, and eating habits. The next slide, please. Basic education is structured around units consisting of grades one to two, 
three to six and seven to nine, all of which utilize different working methods. The choice of method depends, for example, on the skills of different age groups. The aim is to develop the pupil's food sense. That way, the pupil's motivation to learn lasts throughout their lifespan and their knowledge gradually accumulates. The teams, which are illustrated in this picture, carry pedagogical questions, what? Getting to know the topic, how? And then how? Training of activities, and then why? Uh, with contextual understanding. And the next slide, please. In Finland, home economics is a compulsory school subject for all pupils. Home economics education includes both theory and practice. For example, pupils learn the basic skills of cooking, everyday life skills, and skills which are needed for successful group work. The objective of home economics is to develop the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and re readiness required to master everyday life and to adopt a sustainable way of living that promotes well being. And next slide, please. The Basic Education Act in Finland states that pupils who are attending school must be provided with a properly organized and supervised balanced meal free of charge every school day. So the free school meal is for everybody in every school day. Next slide, please. So uh, the school meals are an integral part of national core curriculum and schools pupil welfare services. The municipalities uh, have their local curriculum, which also describes the objectives for education in health, nutrition, and table manners during the school meal. And the next slide, please. Uh, the national recommendations for school meals provide guidelines for the school catering for the well-balanced lunch and healthy snacks. Next slide, please. And food education that promotes participation also develops joy to both eating and learning. The health related and social role of school meals are taken into account when arranging school meals and snacks. And this ne next slide, uh, slide, please. So, learning about well being and sustainability is a lifelong process that starts in early childhood. The period of basic education is important for children and young people, as it is the time of both rapid physical and psychological development from a child into a young adult, as well as the time that pupils gradually become more aware of the choices they make by themselves, as well as the basis for making those choices. So, School meals are important to children and youth's well-being, their ability to learn and to their healthy growth and development. So school meals are an investment into the future, as well as food education. Healthy school lunches can reduce childhood obesity and diabetes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariana, for your presentation and Thank you so much to, to Annika and Anna as well for bringing the different perspectives from your countries. Um, so I think we're going to move on to the question uh, part where we've collected the different questions that have come in for you. But uh, while we're just uh, bringing in those questions, I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, this, uh, this webinar is going to be streamed and, and available on YouTube. So if you want to kind of review it afterwards or send it to your colleagues, um, please do so. Uh, we'll make sure that the link uh, is sent around to you and that you have uh, the ability to access it. It's just one of the questions that was reoccurring in, in the question and answer box. So now um, I'm going to move 
to the questions that came in for Anna, Annika and for Mariana. So we'll just do it in the same way as before in the round, just ensuring that everyone gets a chance, or a chance to answer a question. Um, and we'll just keep going until we run out of time for this part of the, the session. So I'm going to start with you, Annika. Um, uh, so someone is saying, thank you very much for your presentation today. The keyhole criteria are built on nutrient values. In the beginning of the web webinar, Amanda Wood mentioned the keyhole as a tool to implement the food based dietary guidelines. Is the Swedish Health Agency, um, I, perhaps it's also uh, what, the, what this uh, person means is the Swedish Food Agency, your agency, um, are you considering the possibility to incorporate environmental sustainability into future criteria? I think that would, that would be perfect if we could, but it's, it's already quite complicated to handle the, the keyhole with just the, the health as, aspects uh, along with the Nordic nutrition recommendations. So I'm not sure it would be possible to also include sustainability in the keyhole and get a good, good label, but um, we will see now when we have the new Nordic nutrition recommendations if, if that would be possible. But um, so far, I think we have struggled enough just to, to be up keep updated with all the nutrition recommendations. So, so we will see in the future, but I know that there is, it is something that consumers would like us to, to do, to have one symbol that covers everything. <laughs> but it's quite complicated. Thank you. Uh, Anna, this is a question to you. How did the process of creating such national diet, diet guidelines look like, particularly when you were considering cultural sustainability? And how was that included, if it was included? Can you, can you ask that again? Cultural sustainability? Yeah, so, uh, so it's kind of a two, it, to me, it's a bit, a bit of a two-part question. So I'll break it up into two uh, uh, parts for you. How did the process of creating the national uh, uh, dietary guidelines, uh, what did it look like? How did you yeah, go about yeah. that? And then the second qu question is that, um, you know, it was cultural sustainability included and how did you do that? Okay, I'll try to answer that. Um, the process, I'll, I'll just give you a brief one that looks uh, a lot more simple than it actually was. We had the, uh, the evidence from the National Food Institute, and then we sort of created the first draft. And this draft we tested among consumers, and we had our first workshop together with all of our stakeholders at one time. And at the workshop, our stakeholders were, uh, we wanted them to tell us, what do you think about these guidelines? Uh, what do you think the way we have listed them up and the way we communicate them? And to be honest, they didn't like it at all. And neither did the consumers. <laughs> so we actually had to do a, a whole new round, not on the evidence because we, we knew what we would communicate and what the, the guidelines would, would look like in, in the essence, but we didn't know how to communicate it. And then we made another draft. And when I say another draft, I mean, we made a draft number 20 because we have had a lot of drafts because we've had a lot of discussions on, on how to, to communicate these guidelines so they would be best understood and used out there. And then we, um, we invited all our stakeholders again and oh, I forgot, and after the first, first workshops, uh, all the stakeholders were invited to, uh, to a hearing where they can send all their comments for us. So we both had the workshop and we also had their comments. So uh, that's, that was quite a lot. They had a lot of opinions uh, about our first draft. And then we presented the second draft and that was obviously uh, much better. They liked it more. And, and I would also say that that this process has helped us a lot. We had a lot of very valuable com comments from our stakeholders. And after the second draft, we of course made another draft, but, but not we, we didn't change that much in, in, in the third draft. And we tested the campaign and how the consumers understood our campaign. And then we launched. But before we launched, we made a toolbox for all our stakeholders and they had access to this toolbox already in November and we were launching in January and the, why I'm telling you this is that we had a lot of confidence between us and our stakeholders because they were actually able to keep 
the guidelines within. So I think that we all went out there in January, all the, the retailers, food companies, the, the non-governmental organization, they were all with us when we launched. And, and I think I'll, a big thanks to them because that made it possible to, to come out really wide. And the second question again, you're talking about uh, food culture. Yes, so so it was framed as cultural sustainability. Yeah, but, uh, it's it's in the it's also as you said, it's food culture. How do you take that into account? Well, the National Food Institute uh, did a lot of that when they were um, doing uh, their evidence or bringing it to life, but we have also taken some chances because eating legumes is not a part of Danish food culture. But in our opinion, we have to move in that direction if we really want to, to have a more sustainable diet. So that's sort of a choice we made that we in many ways stick with the Danish food culture, but we also need to take some steps in order to change the diet. And that's part of it. And, and if you talk about uh, social culture as well that I, I, I think that might mean something about what I said at, at the end that we need to to also get all those not well educated with us on this travel on this journey and and it's a huge challenge and we haven't really found the path yet but we have some tools that we can use and one of the tools in, is, in my opinion, public-private partnerships. And maybe we'll talk a bit about that later. Thank you, yes. There is a question uh, that is linked to that, but we'll get to that uh, in a bit. Um, Mariana, a question for you. Should schools have their own gardens to produce their own vegetables, as it would uh, both teach agriculture and the importance of local production? Um, maybe you could say something about that. Thank you, Afton. Thank you. Uh, very interesting and good question. Um, that's one one of those uh, methods you, uh, the schools uh, may use. It's not possible in in big cities, uh, in a bigger bigger schools, uh, in in large level. But in some levels, it's possible. It's one choice of methods, I think. Great. Thank you. <laughs> um... In, and a question, this is for everyone now, um, uh, just opening it up to whoever feels, uh, whoever would like to answer. So the question is, um, and this has come up also for in the other session, but we didn't have the chance to get to it, but how do we address the extraordinary political or lobbying power of the meat and dairy industries when it comes to dietary guidelines? Um, anyone willing to answer that question? Could you please repeat? Yeah, so it's um, one of the, the question is, how do we address the political power, the lobbying power of the meat and dairy industry when it comes to dietary guidelines? So it's a, a reoccurring question uh, that we've seen in the, in the q and if, if no one feels- the, it really No one wants to answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I can try to respond to that uh, that question. Is that okay? No problem, Rune. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It was also I, coming up before in your session too. No problem. Yeah, I can tell you how we have tried to handle this in um, in the in the NNR committee. We really encourage uh, input from all stakeholders, including industry and all sorts of of, of, of stakeholders, and um, but we would like to do it open and transparently. So when we have any contact from, from stakeholders, we uh, route them to our official website so that everybody can see the input. And we try to respond to all inputs so that everybody can also see our response. So I think openness and transparency is key. And we would like really to have input and engagement from all possible parties. Thank you, Runa. That's great. Um, and again, that was asked, I believe, to you in your panel beforehand. So it's good that we could uh, answer that question. Um, Annika, I have another question for you. Um, the keyhole is um, only put on food that meets certain criteria 
what do you think about implementing um, simplified front of pack nutrition labeling on all food products that as it is done in several European countries in order to help consumers to understand the nutrition value of all foods? Mm -hmm. I think that's another system like having a traffic lights and so on. And I think if, because the keyhole is that like a positive uh, labeling, it shows what is good to eat, but it doesn't show what is not good for you to eat. But if you have like traffic lights, you also show the, the, red, the red lights. And I think if we would have such a labeling system, it, it needs to be compulsory because otherwise it wouldn't be used, I think, uh, by, the, by the food industry. Uh, so I'm not negative about it, but it's not a system and it needs to be compulsory in, in that case, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and a question for you. Um, the bioavailability of several nutrients differ significantly in animal and plant-based foods. In the new um, Danish food-based dietary guidelines regarding the increased recommendation for legumes, what does the risk asset assessment regarding the bio bioavailability of cr uh, critical minerals such as iron and selenium in uh, legumes conclude? Well, that's a very detailed question <laughs> for me right at the moment, but, but we've looked uh, very carefully into to the evidence from the National Food Institute. And of course, those uh, nutrients are some of the answers of why we do not in total say don't eat any meat. Meat is a part of the Danish food culture and it also brings a lot of important nutrients for us. And, and that's why we've tried to balance between legumes and meat because meat is a, a good source for some of these nutrients. I think that's, that's the shortest way to answer this question. Thanks, Anna. Um, and the final question in this round is going to go to Mariana. And it, the question goes as such, uh, what is your opinion for overcoming the threshold between school and home? Children and especially younger children are, um, are all about learning and are highly ambitious. Um, I, I think about them as teaching their parents to create healthier food patterns as a whole. And the, and the parents need to get on board as well, and not to basically being able to provide the meals that, that uh, their children are learning about in school. So how do you connect these two worlds? By, by, the, by the children, I think. School, schools can cooperate with, with the families and the homes. And, and in Finland, school have to, have to uh, cooperate with, with the families as well. So, and uh, I believe in lifelong learning. So uh, we can also educate later. So you you are never uh, you never know uh, too much, and you never have to, uh, so much skills you you need. So you you don't have to end the school education after basic education. So so I believe in lifelong learning, and there there could be different. Uh, different uh, education for, for adults as well. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to close this part uh, of our webinar for now, and I'm going to shift to Dr. Kremlin Wickram Asingwe. And basically, before I do that, thank you so much uh, to, to Annika and Anna, Anna and, and Mariana for your contributions. Uh, we'll come back to you later, uh, so hold tight. Um, but now, as I said, and uh, to our next guest, uh, Dr. Kremlin Wickramasinghe, and he's the acting head of the WHO European Office for Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases. And Kremlin is going to help us out uh, in kind of zooming out beyond the Nordic region and really putting what you've heard so far into a broader context. So I'm going to hand over to you, Kremlin. Thank you, Afton. Uh, I hope you can hear me. And uh, thank you for that question. And it's great to join you, join the state panel uh, about this important topic. So greetings from the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe. We are always delighted to join these very progressive advanced discussions happening in the Nordic region, but also to share the lessons from other part of our region and also to take your learnings to advance our global agenda. So as Afton mentioned, the 
promotion of healthy and sustainable diets is becoming more and more a priority topic for many member states in our region. In the European region, we work with 53 member states. EU member states, uh, some former Soviet Union countries, CIS countries, Central Asian countries, Balkans. So it's a very diverse range of countries. Of course, for some of them, this is a more priority than the others. But we are learning that sometimes prime ministers are more attractive to the climate change agenda than the nutrition agenda. And so health ministries, health colleagues find that joining these two will give us win-win situation to advance our nutrition policies as well. And with the evidence base becoming ever more enhanced, connected between the uh, climate change, planetary health, and nutrition, I think we can keep more solid steps, step by step. WHO has always been very careful developing guidelines. We always wait for more evidence to come to make sure that we take those steps carefully. So I think now we have uh, more and more evidence coming so we can work with countries and provide guidance. But at the same time, we have had many conversations from our office with our member states. What are the barriers to really accelerate and I think many countries, they recognize the topic, they understand this is important, but they lack capacity at national level to really take action and implement policies. So it is not lack of acceptance, but it's just really the lack of technical capacity to implement some of those recommendations coming from researchers and new evidence. So I think it's good that Nordic nutrition recommendation is an important achievement. I know Nordic countries have been always pushing this agenda ahead and it helps us as organization to move forward with expertise, with your experience, to bring stakeholders together and spread the word and, and move this agenda forward. So we are also building capacity within countries to address some of those challenges. For example, we are building a toolkit to support countries to uh, promote sustainable healthy diets. One of them is an open source model that countries can use to model their new dietary scenarios, their new dietary recommendations, to look at the impact on environment and health outcomes, which will be able to help them to push some of the policy priorities or show the policymakers impact. So far, these kind of exercises have been very expensive academic pieces, only affordable for countries who could afford them and taking years. But I think we are now synthesizing this knowledge of modeling to one place and offering a free tool with a manual to member states. We are also working with stakeholders to work on healthy and sustainable food procurement policies, especially within the EU context, how to navigate that legal landscape. And also about the uh, other interesting things such as digital environments, how we can use the digital landscape to promote that. And more importantly, talking to member states to create a network of member states. I'm coming to this meeting from a 30 member states network talking about how to reduce soil. That is a network that has been running for more than 15 years in the European region chaired by Switzerland. So we have very good examples how countries coming together, discuss their issues and find a solution. So similarly, I think it's time now for WHO to formally establish a network. We have the request from many countries and we really look forward to working with them. So moving forward, I think bilateral and multilateral collaboration is going to be very important. And the Nordic region is a fantastic example and a collaborator in this course. So I really look forward to working with all stakeholders and uh, making this uh, movement uh, stronger in our region. Uh, thank you, Afton, and thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kremlin. And uh, we will get to also the reflection period where, you're, where uh, we'll all have a chance uh, to, to basically reflect on some of the important questions that, uh, that I'll pose to you. But, for now, I would just like to have a look at what's coming in from the second question the, uh, the, that we asked on the Menti. Um, I'd like to see what kind of responses we got. Um, and let's see here, just enlarge in my screen so that I can see it as well. 
So as you can see, we asked basically, what is your number one piece of advice for changing eating habits? Uh, we have a lot of different uh, responses coming in and you can please, please continue to add those, but I'll just let you read those, uh, give you a little bit of time to read some of them that are coming through while we shift towards our next part of the program. And so everything that we've heard and discussed today really indicates that action needs to be taken if we are to move beyond just writing guidelines and developing guidelines, but to actually transforming what people are eating. Um, and so in this final section of the program, I have some uh, specific questions for our speakers. And what I've done is I've kind of put them into groups uh, just so that we have some variation in the questions and, and also really get to the heart of the expertise that the, the different speakers have in, uh, in our webinar today. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with uh, Rona and Helen and Amanda and also Kremlin, and we'll do a round there. And I would like you to answer this question. So the question is, what is your most important piece of advice for how we can move from guidelines to action. And I'm going to start with you, Wona. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a tough question, but um, I think there is a lot to build on from the Nordic model. In the Nordic countries, we have a tradition where health authorities listen to science advice. I believe this is especially important when it comes to sustainable and healthy diet. Uh, more than in any other area, the politician authorities, the industry and public should build on science advice, not from single papers or reports, single scientists or experts, but from the best available systematic synthesis of scientific literature. So these issues are far too complex for individuals to comprehend or synthesize themselves. It is the systematic literature reviews, such as, for example, the IPCC report and the NNR report that we developed, and equivalent reports that should form the basis for action. All of us need to act based on the best available scientific evidence. We will also most likely face a lot of dilemmas when we formulate food guidelines and uh, when we should move from uh, guidelines to actions. So we need to balance all these dilemmas. It is really important to emphasize openness and transparency, to build confidence and trust and to develop a uniform message. There are so many good initiatives from a range of stakeholders and there will probably become many, many more. So it, I think it is really important to coordinate these actions to educate our citizens the best we can. So I think coordination is central. It is not time for partisanship. The situation calls for uniform, bold action by the politicians, the authorities, the, um, and the industry and other stakeholders based on best available scientific evidence. Uh, so I think the way we handle this critical situation is really central. I think you can perhaps say that it's a test of our democratic societies, but it is also a huge opportunity for nutrition and sustainability scientists to contribute to the, science, to the society. And we can easily lose public trust and confidence. So that I think is the reason why we should be transparent and deeply rooted in the best available systematic synthesis of scientific evidence. And, and that is exactly what we try to foster or promote in the NNR 2022 project. Thank you, Wona. Yes, thank you. Um, Helen, uh, same question to you. Most important piece of advice for how we can move from guidelines to, to action. Yeah, thank you. Really good question. And it's probably a sort of different ways to answer that actually, but I'll focus on 
one example where I've done some work previously. So this may not be the most important in terms of overall impact in terms of places to start, but it does seem like one of the most promising places to begin implementation, and that's the food service sector, which of course is just one subsector in the overall system, but I think a very important one and possibly increasingly important going forward if, if people see more convenience, for example, in how they eat. And I think really the key thing is to support where there's already momentum. So in my previous work, I've, I've seen that there is a lot of um, interest and momentum already happening in the food service sector in terms of trying to reduce environmental impacts and implement more kind of healthy and sustainable meal options. And if we think about, for example, food service in university settings, then there's also opportunities to engage kind of active and progressive uh, civil society groups, such as youth groups in that as well, to really help to kind of build that momentum. Um, and I think obviously given sort of the, the changes here, really give consumers the chance as well to actually experience different foods and different meal options. And in terms of support, I think really that could include helping institutes with targets and sort of pathways to implementation and monitoring and actually having reward schemes as well. So I think really, um, obviously it's important kind of longer term to, to alter other aspects of the food system as changes in the food sector, the food service sector occur to avoid basically running into supply issues, for example. But I think that's really, yeah, that's the key one that I would point out as a starting place. Thanks, Helen. Um, a nice compliment also, something, something different, a new food for thought. Um, Amanda, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, thanks, Afton. Uh, there are obviously a, a lot of things that could be said here, uh, but I'll just touch on two related points that I think are only really going to echo what Runa and Helen have been saying. Um, but first, I think if we really want to see this action on, uh, on the scale needed to shift diets of really large parts of the population, um, then there really is not going to be a silver bullet solution or just one place where we need to focus our investment. Um, so sure, if we wanted to, for example, use regulation as our only tool, then that could get us a lot, a lot of action. But given that that's not really the desired uh, path forward, it's going to be that package of complementary solutions that's important to think about. And that of course will be different uh, depending on your specific context. Um, but second and related to that and really echoing what the two previous speakers have said, um, I think it'll be important to harness this kind of existing infrastructure and initiatives and interest in the sustainable food system space, um, you know, here in the Nordics, but also as elsewhere, um, so much has been happening in this space. Um, and to really have impact, we, we need to find those change makers, those decision makers, those innovators across the system and see how we can inject basically the guidelines into their existing work. So we really need to get the guidelines in the hands and the minds of those who are actively shaping our food systems. Thanks, Amanda. Kremlin, same question to you. How do we how do we actually take all this great advice and these guidelines and, and actually make sure that they're being implemented? What is your advice? Thank you, Afton. Not on this guideline. I think in our day-to-day -day job, what we are trying to do is globally WHO develop guideline on salt, on sugar, on physical activity, and a regional office, our day-to-day -day job is supporting countries to implement those guidelines. So not just from sustainable healthy diets perspective, but with our years of experience of supporting countries to implement guidelines with some successes and with uh, some less successes, we understand that uh, one of the major barriers is the lack of capacity at government departments for us from our side. Our main counterpart is government. So I'm mostly talking to you from my experience, what I hear from government may not be the same for Nordic countries, but in most countries, there's one or two people working on the topic 
covering everything. When it's such a multi-sector, multi-dimensional issue, they really don't have the capacity to draft policies, the legal support, the technical support, monitoring, data, access to data, or draft, all of those issues. So what we have been able to do, at least first step, is bringing countries together and they learn what kind of capacity should we have in my institution, in my department to move this forward. They might learn it from a country who has kept those steps uh, ahead. Uh, for example, yesterday we were talking about how to handle misinformation related to nutrition. And then countries such as Belgium and Portugal said what kind of staff they took to the team to tackle nutrition-related misinformation. What kind of terms of reference do you need to recruit a person like that with those skills? Sometimes more computer skills, sometimes more designing skills. And this is not the bread and butter of the nutrition or public health experts to recruit that to your team. So for us, it's the network bringing countries together, really understand how they build the capacity, but in more detail level, and, and then training them and provide continuous support and networking step-by-step step to go forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kremlin. And, and okay, thank you very much to this cluster because you've, you've provided some very interesting uh, reflections on that question, really about bringing, bringing things into implementation. Um, now I want to shift to the other cluster and that cluster is Annika, uh, Anna and Mariana who are we're representing uh, their national governments. And the question for, for the three of you is, what is your most important piece of advice uh, for policymakers who are trying to shift dietary patterns to become healthier and more environmentally sustainable? So based on your wealth of experience, what would you recommend? And I'm going to start with Annika. Thank you. Uh, I think this will be a little bit in line with what we have already heard, but I have five concrete advice, I think, to policymakers. And the first one is base your measures on, uh, on science and evidence, both regarding what is healthy and sustainable to eat, but also when it comes to what measures, what measures you, you, you provide or introduce in, in the society. What evidence do we have for them that they have effects, especially for different socioeconomic groups? The second one is that this is a long-term work. It can't be solved with short-term limited projects or campaigns. It has to be long-term. Uh, we have to focus on changing the, the food environment, especially the food environment around children. And so we make the, uh, the sustainable consumption the, the easiest consumption. Uh, and also the fact that information and education is necessary and it is important as a base, but it will not change eating habits. I think we have to understand that and accept that. And finally, use all tools there is in the toolbox and, and don't be afraid of regulatory measures. Those are my five advice. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's hard to choose the most important one. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming with five. I think there is no silver bullet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You found a way uh, around my question. Very good. Um, Anna, uh, over to you, your, your advice for policy. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll just move on from where Annika left it because I think we have to acknowledge that we can't leave it up to the consumers alone. There are way too many aspects affecting what we're eating. It's not only a choice, it's also about habits. It's about social culture, food culture, economy, and knowledge. And we really have to be aware of that when we want to, to change the eating habits. One way I think that we can make our way through is by building public-private partnerships that is built on scientific-based food-based dietary guidelines. That's very important to stress that that's, that's what we build these partnerships on. And I think that if a partnership has to be successful, and let me also stress that this is not a silver bullet, but it's just one way of working with more structural changes where we don't leave it up to the consumers, but with partnerships where we have clear ambitious but also achievable goals that it, that depends on all partners i think we will be able to move forward 
if we work together on different aspects of the food-based dietary guidelines and we work together from different sectors because that's what we really need if we want to to shift our dietary uh, habits thank you anna um mayana uh, last but not least your advice thank you i think uh, you should focus on everyday life and lifelong learning because often repetitive uh, small or little things have a big impact and then uh, the choice of methods depends for example on the age or skills or motivation of different age groups so give choices don't try to force only and then uh, remember that sustainable lifestyle is a lifelong process that starts in early childhood. The period of early childhood and basic education is important for children and young people. And that's why you have to give good resources. And then a uh, good aim is to develop the food sense of all citizens. The one's motivation to learn lasts throughout their lifespan and their knowledge gradually accumulates. So remember the lifelong learning. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. And thanks to everyone uh, who has answered these questions. Uh, I know they've, it's difficult to summarize them so quickly, but I think you did a fantastic job. Um, so now I'd like to move to the conclusions of this webinar so that we ensure we close in time for you all to move on to your next activities. So conclusions, yes. So we've had some very rich discussions over the past two hours and i wanted to kind of summarize things for us so three three points i think um if we want to change our diets and we want to change the diets of of our fellow citizens we'll need to actually collaborate i think collaboration has come up again and again throughout the past two hours now Nordic collaboration on uh, the nutrition recommendations and dietary guidelines is a partnership of consensus and diverse implementation models. So I think that's a really important takeaway message for everyone listening here today. The second thing is that we need to move from recommendations and guidelines into transformation. So while these, these tools are extremely important because they basically set the foundation and we and we can refer to them it's not to disregard them but to now look towards the implementation and what we can do and in order to to do this and to aid this transformation that we wish to see we'll have to find new and creative approaches and at the same time i think we can also celebrate because when we look at the implementation and what's happening right now in the nordic region we can see that things there's already things that are happening. We saw great examples of that. We have the keyhole, we have you know, school meals. We've been talking about also in, in public canteens, public offices. Um, so you know, things are happening and we have to acknowledge that. Finally, I've also heard um, some interesting keywords that I wanted to share with you. It's about balancing the dilemmas. It's about openness, transparency, uniform messages coordination, bold actions, public trust, ambition, reward schemes, lifelong learning, harnessing existing infrastructure, capacity building, long-termism, culture, public-private partnerships. So we've come to the end of this webinar and I think it's been really, really interesting to hear from all of the speakers and I hope that everyone who's tuned in uh, can also agree with me. So on behalf of the Nordic Council of Ministers, I would like to thank everyone for taking the time because two hours is a pretty big chunk of your day. And you can rewatch any part of this webinar um, 
on the Facebook channel, but also on the YouTube channel of the Nordic Council of Ministers. And last but not least, I also want to thank our speakers again, and to everyone who is working behind the scenes to make sure that this webinar uh, has functioned and that we could actually finish uh, a little bit ahead of the schedule, imagine that. So uh, I'd like to sign off for now and uh, say, take care everyone. And, uh, and please take all this information that you have received today, reflect on it and start implementing. Thank you very much.